And there we are. I guess hey. we're live now. Hello, Sweet. everybody. Um, welcome to Poetry from the Field with me. My name is Marcelo Hernandez Castillo. Um, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing um, the poet Derek Austin today. Um, and there are a lot of things that I can say about Derek um, in terms of introductions. Um, I would just start with uh, saying that um, Derek had received his BA from the University of Tampa and his MFA from the University of Michigan where he and I met um, many moons ago. He is the author of Trouble the Water, which won the April and Junior Prize uh, from BOA Editions, selected by Mary Sebist. And um, it has, uh, is currently a uh, Wallace, uh, a Ron Wallace Poetry Fellow at the, oh no, he has been a fellow at the um, Wisconsin <laughs> Institute of Creative Writing. He is currently a Stegner Fellow at Stanford University and his forthcoming book, Tenderness is going to be released with BOA Editions. Um, a Kaveh Kanem Fellow, um, publications every which way. Um, so it's truly, truly a, an honor to have you here with us, Derek, um, in our little corner of, well, now you're here in California because before, you know, you were out in the Midwest and um, now you're here in California, but as we had mentioned, um, not much to see of California from the view of a pandemic. Um, so welcome, welcome. Um, Derek um, is going to be reading some of his poems today. Uh, some of them are going to be from his new book. Uh, maybe some of them are going to be from his first book. Um, and then afterwards, we will open it up for a discussion. If you would like, if you have a question that you would like to ask Derek, you could type it up in the comments, um, in the comment section, and I will field those questions. Um, and if not, we have a lot of stuff to talk about in terms of writing, poetry, and art life. Um, so Derek, the stage is yours. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's really, it's actually sort of funny that we're doing this today um, because like Marcelo mentioned, my second book, Tenderness, is coming out in the fall. And Monday I got the digital proofs of my book. So I'm like editing it for the final time before it's <laughs> before it's off to the presses and off to the printers. How exciting. Um, yeah, it's exciting and, and terrifying too, but I guess we can talk about that later. Um, so before I read from that one, I'm gonna read um, the last poem in Trouble the Water, uh, which is called Vespers. Lord in the pigment, the crushed colored stones, Lord in the carved marble chest, I turn away from art. You are between my eye and what I see. Forgive my errant gaze. Tonight, I can't sleep and won't frighten the deer in my peonies. Like children who rub their grimy hands over everything, they only want to touch and be touched by grass. They've never known violence, cars howling out of darkness. Lord and the camellia drifting in and out of sight, like those blushing perfumed heads, will you welcome me? I too am little more than a stranger in your garden. Stroke my, velvet stroke my velvety antlers, open your palms. And now time to read some new poems from Tenderness. Um, I'll start with the title poem. <clears throat> Tenderness. That summer, I was a body. I was that body, the body. Overnight, a fog of linen inside the Mo Victorian down the block. Another house empty for the season, for the season, for the season. Hours built up on both sides of my bedroom door. Morgan and Denez rode in the Grand Canal at Versailles. Morgan filled a postcard with her hands and memory. Rose quartz, a diary, holy water. With what belief, what could I have asked for? Leaving my apartment for the first time in days, I walked five minutes to Lake Mendota. 
barking, honking, shrieking, grunting. Men tested their bodies for each other and themselves. Open doors to admit the breeze, the possibility of that one guest. When Emily Bronte wrote, they've gone through and through me like wine through water and altered the color of my mind, she wasn't writing about my depression. Double tapped a photo of Morgan and Angel posing near a green door with hinges older than the constitution. They read their black poems in English to black people who spoke English and French and Arabic. If I sent a postcard to everyone I loved, it'd say, sometimes I think you're just too good for me. The most personal question I'm consistently asked, why are you so quiet? That I'm getting this all down wrong, that I'm getting it down at all. Um, so there, uh, there are a lot of poems um, addressed to friends of mine and they're in the forms of letters, which when I was writing them was just a cute conceit that I thought was fun. Um, but now having been stuck at home for a year, <laughs> they're sort of weirdly poignant in a different kind of way. Um, and this is one of them. This one's called Letter to Brandon. I wish you were with me when I saw the most stylish black woman stroll down State Street in a red velvet coat. It was like a scene out of the hours. Carrying a bouquet, she entered those apartments near our favorite Italian place. Remember our muscular waiter's gentle voice. Her lilies, for her bay, I hoped, brightened an afternoon of two women detangling hair. Is this how you write fiction? Plot isn't fate exactly. Drinking rosé at Gibbs, I thought of you typing in your dream house near Canada, the shadows of spruces on a lake. I'd be somewhere else, who knows where, waiting for your stories where no choice is barred or above consideration. Um, the funny thing about reading from this for the first time is like, I haven't <laughs> set a routine or a pattern for myself yet. Yeah. So I'm just like, what are poems? <laughs> what is in this book? <laughs> um, I'll read this one. This one's sort of, uh, it's a prose poem that's uh, set in a monastery. <laughs> that's about all you need to know about it. It's called Cachet and Compassion. We kissed in parting and greeting. Brother John painted our black Madonna and close as he was to her face, he often preaches. He was never closer to wisdom. Brother Benjamin, difficult at times, but full of rue and regret that he cannot control his need to order. Utensils, stones, usually books, taps himself wildly and sometimes wails. Brother Baptiste once asked, how do I fit into my body? Brother Javier survived the plague. We think nothing of his fever whitened hair. No one returns untouched from death's strange land. Brother Jeremiah covers pears and cloth to protect from sudden frost. We've only heard about the sea, but after a day's labor, he smelled like my dream of the sea. Sometimes my brother offers a pear and knife, its handle made lustrous with the passing of hands. And to follow on that uh, sort of mystical track, um, this next one I'm gonna read is called Black Magdalene and it's inspired in its way by, um, there's an artistic tradition in European art of Black Madonnas, um, which is a tradition that's old as, uh, you know, Christianity essentially. Um, but anyway, I wanted to write a poem that's that imagined a black Mary Magdalene. And this is sort of my attempt at it. Oh, and another thing is that um, this one sort of takes as its starting point, this uh, medieval legend about Mary Magdalene and what happened to her after the events of the gospels. And in one version of the story, she um, and some other women traveled to France and ended up in like uh, Mediterranean France and stayed there for the rest of her life, uh, meditating and contemplating God, as you do. Um, Black Magdalene. In one version of her story, she left Jerusalem for France by boat, crossing a patrolled sea. 
She knows the faces of women refused asylum by the state. The state calls them refuse. In France, she contemplated. She dreamed not of Christ, but her ladies. Her ladies sang, her ladies incised wax tablets. Her ladies revealed the length of the gown of God. She saw her ladies in trees, black women climbing or reclining on branches like small silver blossoms and knew them in her heart. And uh, I'll just end with this one. And it's called Lilting. In bed, we are lavender together. We watch the little theater of ours. Walking her dogs, our neighbor crosses the lakeside corner, hoop earrings echoing the birch's colors. Tend your joy, you whisper, as if a charm against eviction or some harm we might inflict on each other. For once, I don't hear you from the room called memory. Open the window. Risk, breath, our seasons. Let them in. Let them in. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a beautiful reading, Derek. Um, and I'm so glad you read new work, and I'm so glad you read from the, um, from the new book, um, which I cannot wait to hold in my hands. Um, you know, these, these poems are of a piece, I think, with your larger work, but also feel unique. And I know we've talked about this before, but I wanted to kind of uh, resurrect that kind of conversation um, and thinking about what was your guiding or driving force behind the new book um, of poems? Um, and how, how is that different from your first book? Um, as we were mentioning, you know, that when working on something that is like larger than one piece, um, you know, you always you always need that one shining light, that one um, guiding question um, or concern that you know not everything has to be about that, but is is lighting the way um, and is really charging underneath the poems. So um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, um, either. Uh, what that was for you in this new book of poems or how that changed for you from from the first to the second? Sure. So I think one of the key differences between uh, working on the first one and working on this second book is that um, the second book was really written out of a lot of unknowing. Like with the first book, um, I sort of knew exactly what I wanted to do when I did it. <laughs> like I knew, like I knew I wanted to, um, you know, write poems about Baroque art. I knew I wanted to write poems about the Florida Gulf Coast. I knew I wanted to write um, queer love poems. Like I wanted all of that to be in conversation with each other, and I just did it. Um, whereas with this book, it was really a process of figuring out how to write poems again. Like I, I didn't want to write. Trouble the Water Part Two, Electric Boogaloo. So I was trying to do new things in my poems and make it exciting and fun for me, and to revive the the joy in writing poems. Um, so with tenderness, um, I guess like the, I started writing it um, in fall twenty fourteen. I guess is like when the oldest poems are from twenty fourteen to 2015 and I knew, the only thing that I knew I wanted a second book to do is I wanted to chasten my language and not um, rely so heavily on figurative language um, like I did my first book uh, and you know, not feel compelled to gild the lily and like adding an image just because I can. Um, I also wanted to see if I could write autobiographically and turn the stuff of my life into poems because the first book is not <laughs> autobiographical whatsoever um whereas this one really is like it's about me like my family is in it my friends are in it you're in it um <laughs> so i like i wanted to know if i could uh you know do that and just take like the mundane stuff of my life and make it into poems um and i also knew i wanted it to be like a more outward facing book like trouble the water is very interior it's very like the speaker or the speaker and his lover um whereas this book i hope uh 
looks more out to the world and has, uh, you know, a wider scope to it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you kind of answered what I was gonna ask next, and that was basically how how was it like writing a second book? And I only asked this for myself because I don't know <laughs> how to write a second book of poems. And you were saying about how, you know, um, learning how to write a poem again um, and uh, figuring out how, how to write poems again. Was there one thing, I guess, in particular, you know you, you know what you didn't want. Um, and so it was more of a, a process of, I guess you could say like um, discovering versus like, um, you, versus like the first book where you knew the subjects and you knew, and you just had to like, you know, um, you had a, a clearer path of getting there, um, whereas this one was more um, in discovery. But what was something that new that you discovered about what poems can do um, in coming to now a second project and thinking about it as a second project? Um, I guess what were you most surprised by? Um, you know, rediscovering poetry again because, you know, I think that with each book um that that we write we we kind of rediscover uh something about writing which is why probably we we will keep writing um so what was something something that surprised you um oh goodness i feel like there are a bunch of things that surprised me um i think um i think one thing that surprised me was um my ability to be more concise, I guess, or to feel more comfortable with being, uh, with being concise and being direct. Um, like I remember when I wrote Trouble of the Water, I like was very antagonistic to like abstraction in poems. Like I, I just did not know how that worked or like how people did it. And so like I tried to not use abstractions in the first book. Whereas this one, I felt more comfortable just. Uh, stating things out right and, and like having like a line in a poem that's like i'm depressed or i am angry or like you know i i didn't feel as compelled to uh to you know like find an image that like expressed my feeling i would just say it um i was also really surprised um i was surprised by the subject matter actually of like poem of like things that pops up in my poems that I had no idea would happen. Like I, there are poems about childhood in this new book, which I've never done. I I was like, <laughs> when I was younger, I was like, I don't want to like write those childhood poems that are like, woe is me, like X and Y happened to me in childhood and this is why I'm crazy as an adult. Like I just didn't want to do that. Um, but I feel like inevitably everybody writes something about childhood and like that was really surprising to me and um and like writing about my family and writing about my life and like finding finding the the art and finding the beauty I guess in just like daily life as opposed to like having to find it in an old painting or like a biblical story um yeah, those things were surprising too. And a lot of movies, there's so many movies in this book and I did not <laughs> plan that. <laughs> so I have, um, okay, I'll save that question for the end because it has to do something with like pop culture. But I mean, I can go all over the place. Um, uh, we've got you know, all afternoon. <laughs> we've got all afternoon. Um, you know, because I, I, I get what you mean about, you know, certain things that, were difficult to write about even, you know, in the first book and now reveal themselves in the second book, almost as if um, there are subjects that that will come with their own um, vehicle. And that vehicle here happens to be a whole new project. Um, but there are a lot of things that carried over, right? You, you had mentioned about not, not wanting to write Trouble of the Water uh, 2.0, but, um, what are some of the things that you that you know, you know, as a poet, just don't change about you? That as a writer, as an artist, 
you know, will continue to be motifs. I guess this question is, you know, the question that a lot of artists face is what are your obsessions? And did any of those carry forward into your new writing? And maybe things that you're going to continue exploring because we're never really, uh, you know, fully uh, content with, with our obsessions. Otherwise, they wouldn't be obsessions. We still don't fully understand them, which is why we continue to, you know, explore them uh, in different ways. But what are some of the things that did carry over? Um, I mean, like, I'm always going to uh, write acrostic poems about an old painting. Like, that, like that's just going to be me for as long as I'm a poet. Um, you know, like, that's going to keep happening. I mean, I think the thing with that and, like, with any obsession is, is just finding new ways to tackle it. Like, with uh, with writing about visual art, like the first book was very much like medieval and Baroque art. And I feel like this book is, is a lot of French painting. It's a lot of Rococo paintings. Um, and I'm still writing a lot about French paintings for some reason. Um, so like that carried over and like that still exists. And, you know, there's still poems of desire and longing um, in the second book. But I think the key difference there is um, I don't know why my building's shaking. Here we go. No, it's over. Oh, there's a plane flying over. Anyway, um, I think the difference there in writing these new love poems and these new poems about desire is I was less afraid of having the speaker like be be accountable and be um, be less than chivalrous, so to speak. Um, you know, in the first book, I feel like the position of like the lover in those poems was very much like a position of of frustrated longing, a position of of sadness and sort and sort of like sitting in it. Um, whereas I think with this book, at least what I try to do is have a speaker that's a bit of an ass and who's a bit of like not a good person and who um, you know is selfish in a relationship and who. Uh, you know, isn't isn't just playing the wronged party. Um, and then, like, um, you know, like you mentioned briefly before, like, there's still pop culture stuff in in this uh, collection. Um, you know, movies seem to be the thing uh, in this book. Um, though I think that I think that's just me in general, as I like to write a lot about movies. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, the carryover is always fun because it's always exciting to see how you're growing alongside your obsessions and seeing um, and seeing what what new facets of it you find interesting. Um, you know, that's always exciting to see, and it's exciting. It's one of the fun parts of, of being a writer is having like this weird, <laughs> this weird psychic diary of a life. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I and mean, is that is that a new vulnerability for you of, you know, seeing the um, less, I guess, like, you know, we always want to see ourselves as like the hero of, of of our stories, but the the kinds of vulnerabilities that at least that I'm I've always been afraid of is the ones that don't make me look good, and so um, you know, in which, like you say, you know, uh, uh, paint you as less than. Uh, an ideal uh, person. So is, was that a new kind of vulnerability that, that uh, I mean, what was the difference between that kind of vulnerability and the kind of vulnerability in which you are just, um, you know, uh, exposing parts of yourself? Um, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a different kind of vulnerability. I mean, I think it just, uh, is also partially like a matter of just being a bit older. Um, and, 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 you know, seeing, seeing the parts of yourself that could use more work, um, you know, also I think that, um, you know, a, a big part of writing tenderness is writing about being depressed for the past several years. Um, and I feel like writing about that by necessity, you sort of have to, half straight about, you know, yourself not at 100%. Like it's it's the, you know, the part of you that the the mask is hiding or daily mask is hiding, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but again, like it's, 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 
in terms of writing about it, it's like a different, you know, artistic challenge. Like how do you, how does one write oneself as, as you know, not the perfect hero in their poems and not overdo it, you know? How does one, um, you know, not make a cartoon of yourself in sort of revealing the less than fabulous aspects of yourself? It's all, it's a different kind of artistic challenge too. And like, you know, <laughs> showing yourself as like the cute person who was wrong. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's that difference of being just being self deprecatory versus um, in like, uh, in like, uh, I'm doing it, but I'm also doing it so that, you know, um, so that it somehow, um, uh, in the end makes me look good or something like that. But I think as we get older and, you know, um, both you and I uh, kind of are figuring a lot of these things out um, as we get older. Um, and we're always talking about, you know, uh, <laughs> how is it that, you know, it's almost been 10 years since we um, met. Um, but these are kind of new questions that, that we tend to pose to ourselves. and new ways of approaching life that, you know, I know I I couldn't write my first book had I started in my 30s. Um, you know, uh, is this a book that you feel could have only happened um, now? Um, or could something else have prepared you for writing this book first versus the first one? No, I mean, I think, uh... I think I had to write this one now. Like I sort of, I sort of jokingly say that this, that tenderness is my Saturn return book. And, you know, insofar as like I wrote it through my late twenties, like honestly, yeah, more or less <laughs> my Saturn return just ended like two months ago. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like it, it's, I could only write about it now. And it's funny cause you know, there are always writers who like older writers, um, who have had like storied careers and have multiple books. Some of like some of them often talk about how like they're embarrassed of their first book and like how, you know, they wish it was struck from the record. And like, you know, on the one hand I like get it, but also I feel uh I feel like I hope I'm never that that person. I look at my first book and I'm embarrassed by it. Like honestly, I look back on it and it's like, sure, are there are there parts of it I would change? Absolutely. Like there are poems I would revise instantly I would change the whole book but I can only have written Trouble of Water then like it's and that's why I think it works is that like it is a young man's book it is like the yeah. book of my early 20s you know and I'm proud of it like <laughs> I, I was bold I like think about what I was writing and like just like I was very confident <laughs> which is like a very different I did not feel confident working on this book at all um yeah, and yeah. That, goes, that goes back to the same thing that I was, I was talking about, like that there's a different kind of driving force. And it's not just a question, but also how you, um, uh, you know, how you are able to manage the, your life and, and the circumstances and the subjects all at once. Um, and so, uh, yes, there, you know, I don't think I've met a writer with multiple books that don't doesn't regret one thing or other about their first book. And like you say, like some would even uh, uh, wish that they were uh, somehow magically erased because they they are embarrassed about that. But that their 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 first books sometimes are are you know why they continued writing and allowed them to con continue having that career. Um, and so yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in how like the growth of of artists and how the growth of a poet um, can be traced by their work. And as you say, like that is uh, a book about you know um, partly about being like in that in that uh, uh, of that age. And you know, it's part of the reason why Rambo wrote the you know the way he did because he was 15 when he wrote that when he wrote all of his uh, prose poems and why, um, you know, Keats died at what, 24? Um, and so these, these, these poems, you know, come from a different place. Um, somebody says, no regrets 
for beginnings. We all have them. Um, (laughs) You know, I I would be remiss if we talked about it a little already, but I would be really remiss if we didn't talk more about art because I know Ekphrasis, as you said, is something that um, is is something central to to your practice, to your aesthetic and something that is what is one of your uh, obsessions, but maybe, you know, uh, talking more specifically about the art side of it, um, what compels you to some of the work that you, um, what draws you to some of the, some of your favorite work, you know, uh, what do some of your artists do or how do they do what they do that draws you to them? Um, and maybe you can uh, uh, talk about a, f- a few of them. Yeah, sure. I mean, um... It's it's funny because it's it's one of those things that that has changed since I've gotten older. Like my taste, you know, and writers have changed, and so it's my taste in you know the artists that I really love. Like with the first book, like I mentioned, a lot of the ekphrastic poems, a lot of the poems that feature visual art in them, were really inspired by medieval art, by Byzantine art in particular, um, by Baroque art. Um, thinking a lot about Caravaggio, about Bernini. Um, And I think like when I was writing those poems, the thing about the paintings that compelled me was just like the high drama of it all. You know, it's like, it's the drama of Christianity written in, you know, sensuous marble, written in like gold mosaics um, and like these lush oil paintings, like everything is out of 10, which, you know, fit me in my early 20s. Everything needed to be out of 10. Um, and so I was like, I was really interested in, in the style of excess in, you know, how, you know, the decorative can function in visual art and in poetry. Um, whereas with these new poems, with tenderness, I found myself drawn a lot to uh, French art, funnily enough, which was never really a thing that I much cared for um, in the sense that a lot of the poems are really inspired by Rococo artists. So Fragonard, Watteau, um, you know, I was really, I was suddenly drawn by the whole, <laughs> the the pink fantasy of Rococo art. Mm-hmm. But I think more specifically, because I was also really drawn by the Impressionists in a different way, um, I had long loved Impressionism ever since I was like a little kid and I sort of fell off when I was a teenager. But like, I was really drawn by the social paintings, you know, all of, uh, you know, Renoir's paintings of folks getting together and having a good time. Like I was really enamored of the social world that both the the Impressionist painters and the Rococo painters in different ways were really interested in. you know, I was interested in, in the wider world, in friendships and relationships and, you know, what happens when people get together as opposed to like the sort of, uh, you know, private devotional world of, of you know, medieval Christian art. Um, so yeah, you know, I think that my taste in paintings moves with, you know, how I'm feeling as a, as a poet. And so, yeah, I'm still sort of, stuck in this French moment, but I'm also like, I think I'm I'm interested in, in Giorgione, who's like this weird uh, Italian painter who's, whose paintings are very uh, hermetic and very um, hard to read um, in the sense of a narrative. And I'm feeling uh, hermetic. I'm feeling like moving away from writing about myself and writing about the world. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean the, I mean those those earlier artists um, like Caravaggio, you know, um, feel so visceral. And like you say, there is an opulence about that about the Baroque style in 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 terms of like its gildedness. But um, thinking about like Caravaggio, um, there is like uh, an antithesis to tenderness that doesn't that doesn't feel like it exists in Caravaggio. You know, you have Judith holding the beheaded, um, the 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 head of um, what's his name? Um, Holofernes. Holofernes. Yes, that's one of my favorite pieces. <laughs> and and um, you know, even and 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 how isn't that his self portrait? Isn't that 
Caravaggio himself? Uh, well, no, the pain, that one is, um, is David and Goliath and uh, Goliath's head is supposed to be a self portrait of him. That's what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you, there's, yeah, there's like uh, almost a visceralness and uh, you know, just as, as, as like dramatic, as dramatic as it was, um, it does feel like there, there's almost, um, I mean, is there, is there almost aggression in its specificity of like, of like how, uh, of the body and feeling and seeing the body as very visceral, very corporeal, very, you know, veins and how anatomically correct, um, you know, especially uh, the, uh, even, even like the neoclassical uh, painters were. Um, but moving over to like Renoir, moving over to like, you know, like you say, like this, this, this. Um, what did you What did you say about it? it was um, uh, pink cloud or pink fantasy? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and I and I do I do I do see that, and I like. I mean, my my two favorites are like the French impressionist, and then um, and then the abstract expressionist. But um, you know, is that is I guess what what hap How do you now that we know, like now that we have an idea of of what art you know compels you, um, how do you approach art? And is it always is it always with an approach with the caveat that this might be something that might exist on paper? Um, you know, how is it that you engage with art? Like walk like walk us through your your time in a museum, um, and. You know, uh, is there art that exists for its sake, or is it, you know, somehow uh, meant to stir something in us? In which case, you know, y y we have the the conventions of like the acrostic poem to kind of like make new meaning out of that. And maybe for uh, people who don't know, we we probably who we got ahead of ourselves, but who don't know what acrostic painting is, I guess the question starts is like, how do you? Um, yeah, how do you approach uh, uh, art? Uh, let's say you approach a new painting. Um, well, it's interesting because I, I, because now I'm trying to think of like if there's a difference between the way that I work on a an ekphrastic poem on a poem about visual art. Um, if there's a difference between that and like how I engage with it in a museum, and I guess mm -hmm. like. I mean, when I go to a museum, I'm not like thinking about like, where am I gonna find the next poem? Like, I'm not like uh, hunting for uh, <laughs> the next inspiration. Um, it just, it tends to be, um, it tends to be like a stroll for me. I'm just like, wa I just walk. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of the joy of it is, um, you know, of course seeing like all the, all of all of the museums like prized pieces and all the 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 famous ones but also part of the joy is is finding like the small thing and the strange thing that like you wouldn't have noticed before or you know a a lesser known work by one of your favorite painters is also like always a fun thing to encounter um but i think for me like the important part is just like when a piece seizes you and just like you have to just you know, <laughs> stare, stand there for a while and, and stare and like be in that moment. And um, you never know when or how it might come. Cause you know, sometimes it's not like your favorite piece. Sometimes it's just like a really, it's something else. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, when I it comes to the page and when it comes to writing about visual art, my thing has always been, um, the like the magic of an ekphrastic poem is is the experience of like apprehending this piece of art it's not really about like what the thing is it's not really about describing it so much as like the intersection of like your experience of it and the context and the history of of the piece of art um because you know a funny thing about like museum going is that so much of the art there is divorced from its context. You know, you'll have like altarpieces that like aren't in the churches they're originally from. You'll have, you know, like 
all like these paintings and these objects had like actual functions for people. They aren't just like pretty things to look at. Right. And so, you know, part of the joy for me is like, is, is thinking about that and wrestling with, you know, the histories of these objects uh, as they collide with like my history as um, a queer black American poet in the 21st century. Like how do those, uh, what happens at those intersections? Um, and that's the magic for me. Cause you know, it's like, we live in an age where we can take out our phones and like look at a painting. So like what then is like the purpose of writing about art when everybody can look at it, you know? So for me, it's not really about describing a thing in line breaks necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but, but writing the experience um, and writing what comes out of, of, of seeing a piece of art for you because it's different for everybody. Right. Right. It is no it is no longer the necessity to describe it simply. I mean, there is that just as a as like a convention and 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 just like as a trope, but um but yeah, of of recognizing these intersections that you are coming across as um someone who walks through the world in a race engendered body, um and and intersecting with with uh with the history and context of the art that, that is on display, as you say, we move from one room to another and we're suddenly in a different century. And we're suddenly um, in a different, completely different uh, era. And so I guess what I'm getting from that is like, there isn't always a necessity to, and I'm remembering um, this, this, this comes from a tweet from our mutual friend Chen Chen. Um, and I always remember this, and I always uh, put this even on my syllabus about, um, like there's, there isn't always the necessity to understand things in terms of like, I have to somehow break this open. Somehow there is a key to this that I have to find in order to fully appreciate this. And the inherent kind of violence there is behind that of um, thinking that uh, there is something purposefully hidden behind, you know, the colors, the the um the content um and so on and so forth it, it, in either poetry or in art um but just allowing it to be and allowing you to exist in the same space as as the other thing and appreciating it just for for its existence rather than how it can um benefit you in one way or another as you say like you're not entering a museum and thinking like well how can i use some of this how can i wh where am i going to find my next poem um and so just uh you know entering so that uh you know do you ever i guess this is this is something that that we have talked about like grad school has ruined us um <laughs> and certainly for me like grad school has ruined my uh experience of watching movies like I can't watch movies the way that I used to um because somehow I'm always thinking about like you know about plot about the cinematography about like holes in the in their logic about um you know character development and all that so I mean maybe this is kind of a um a segue into into uh, you know another thing that you're very interested in is movies and you know do you approach uh movies the same way in which you approach art or you know uh what is it about movies that that compels you so much um you know and what do you enjoy about movies and maybe what particular genres uh, somebody in the in the in the um in the chat asked uh, what what type of movies uh sure i mean it's it's so funny that she, that she mentioned how like <laughs> grad school is like made us, you know, look at a thing and now we're like thinking about it all the time. But I think that's like that for me, that can be a fun thing, you know, is, you know, it's just uh, different ways of engaging with um, a piece of art or a piece of media is uh, thinking about it critically. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> I feel like that's a very Virgo answer. Um, but with movies, I I I think I do like I approach it from the same way that I think about visual art. Um, you know, like I I think I mentioned it before, but I truly didn't even notice uh, that there was a whole bunch of movie stuff in this book. It wasn't until I, I started ordering it and like putting the book together that I realized it's like 
you know, there are movie titles and actors and, uh, you know, some of the, some of the poems are like actually about movies, but like it was just everywhere. And um, it's funny cause I saw a tweet <laughs> the other day that was something like, oh, I forget exactly what it was. It was basically like depressed people have great taste in movies cause that's all we do all day. <laughs> and I was like, oh wow. <laughs> right. Um, but um, I mean, I honestly think that's why movies like appeared so much in it is like, you know, a sort of floating thing about my depression as a thing that I did. Um, Cause it's like, how do you write about depression? It's like, it's not, at least how I experience that, it's not a particularly thrilling thing to see me just in bed for hours. So it's like, how do you like write about it? And it's like, I guess that's one of the ways that it manifests in the book, funnily enough. Um, but as for genres of things, I think I don't really have a, um, I don't think I have like a favorite, well, that's not true. What I want to say is like, I'll basically watch anything more or less if it's sort of like, uh, I love like glossy sort of prestige movies, like Oscar Beatty type things or like the types of movies I love. I love costume dramas. I'm like a Merchant Ivory girl. So like <laughs> anything with like a great costume budget, I'm there. Um, what else do I love? I just, um, <laughs> um, I also love old movies. You know, I love, you know, all kinds of, you know, old things. Like one of the, I guess like when I've been uh, in quarantine this past year, I've been like on the Criterion Collection and just like watching old things I hadn't seen before. Um, like the other week I watched Shanghai Express for the first time and it was like my first Marlena Dietrich and anime Wong movie. And I'm like, oh wow, this is like amazing to see her like work the glamor in action. Um, yeah, I don't really, I don't think I've thought about like how movies sort of appear because i've written about pop culture in the past and it's usually sort of like uh writing about a figure a pop cultural figure like i have my drake poems in in tenderness and mm -hmm. uh i have like um a dorian corey poem in tenderness i have a chris hemsworth poem coming out sometime this year so they tend to be like about people in hollywood and movies as opposed mm -hmm. to movies themselves right and um I think I just treated it almost like an acrostic exercise and just like, you know, wrote about my experience of, of watching the movie. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Your engagement with them rather than like the, the thing itself. Um, and so do you think that, I guess, you know, the correlation between, um, you know, the movie watching experience and somebody's mental health, do you think, was it because it felt like an escapism or did it feel like an immersion? Um, I'm trying to think about the difference between the two or if I can clarify that, but if that makes sense at all, um, you know, uh, did you find yourself being immersed in it or escaping to them? Um, I, mean, I mean, I think in my actual life, it was like, just like an escape from like being depressed all day. But, you know, in terms of, of the writing of the poems, I think um, they weren't, I don't think of them as an, as an escape in terms of writing about them. I think, uh, I think there's a sort of element of escape for the readers in the sense of like, um, leaving a sort of decorum that people expect out of poetry. Um, so I think there's like a sense of escape and fun and play when people encounter poems about movies or pop culture. But for me, it's just another way of, of, of engaging more deeply with the world and thinking, um, you know, thinking through different things via a movie. Um, yeah, like a, there's a movie poem in the book um, about the movie Jackie with uh, Natalie Portman in it uh, playing Jackie Kennedy. And the poem isn't, the poem isn't obviously about the movie in the sense that like it's thinking about images and thinking about race and gender and, you know, who gets to control their image and how images are used and, and thinking about grief. Um, and like, Jackie's a movie that's all about grief, but you know you wouldn't necessarily think of it as a as an interesting means to talk about uh, you know images of black people suffering and how that's disseminated in the culture. 
Um, and, you know, like the difference, you know, the ways that this affluent, powerful white woman could control her image in ways that black women are often unable to. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, like anything else that we write about, it's just a way of, you know, digging our heels deeper into the world. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, so I wanted to leave some, have some space um, for uh, some questions we have from the audience. Um, and um, one of them is a Sailor Moon question. Oh my God, uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they said, you know, uh, speaking about Sailor Moon, they said they would love to hear your thoughts on, um, they said, having read your essay on effeminacy and Sailor Moon, I would love to hear your thoughts on intersectional feminism. Um, oops. Okay, um, I, love, I love that my Sailor Moon essay has made an appearance. Um, <laughs> that's so cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, with that essay in particular, I was really interested in, um, so for those who don't know, like Sailor Moon is like this popular anime um, that's, uh, that could be derisively uh, said uh, spoken of as, as being uh, really girly or, you know, marketed towards girls. And it was a show that I really loved. And it was a show that was really um, foundational for me as the queer kid, uh, figuring out my identity um, in the sense that it gave me a story about these five girls who were also superheroes, but also were best friends in middle school. And it gave me, um, it gave me examples of of feminine power, sure, but also like just feminine friendship and different ways uh, to sort of carry feminine energy. Cause it's like, you know, the show sort of like Power Rangers or like the X-Men in the sense that like each of the, the characters are sort of these, these, you know, personas or types, you know, there's the smart one, there's, uh, um, you know, the, the sort of hot-headed one, there's the tomboy, like there's all different kinds of characters. And it was really important to me to like, just see different ways of, of embodying feminists. And also with that essay, I was like interested in, um, in, in like the intersections of that with, with race of like growing up as like a black boy and like the particular expectations um, I felt I had, you know, like the, you know, the, the, the ideas about how to exist as a black man that like I had internalized then and how I felt like it didn't fit in that. And um, yeah, it was, it was really important for me. And like the art and art by women has always been foundational to me as a writer. Um, it's always been really important for me as a poet to exist in, in exist and engage in the work of women because because how can you how can you not like if it, it's it's like an aesthetic impoverishment if you don't engage in the work of of women and femmes in the arts and anywhere else mm -hmm. um you know the the women in my life have often been like the spaces where i could be myself and could uh exist and and you know think critically about art and and you know just hang out and be people um yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. um so we have uh i want to be conscious of time so we have about five oh, yeah. or five more minutes or so but maybe in in closing um i did want to talk about um what does time between uh writing books look like for you? Um, or does that not exist? Are you writing even when you're not writing? I guess now that you have finished, you know, um, this next project, yeah. um, what does this space look like for you? Um, you know, are you working on something now or are you using this time to, to maybe read to, um, you know, artists need downtime too, you know? Um, 
because we're 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 always on on these ideas of like production, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and like how um, productive are you? Um, and those pressures. So I guess I mean this is this is just a question of of what does is there an in between time for you, or is it like more of a continuation? Yeah, that's that's really interesting because um, yeah. you know with the fir- when I finished the first book in 2014, I was still writing poems, and I had like and I kept writing poems. Uh, I don't think there was ever a year where like I just wasn't like writing a thing. Um, but that said, I didn't start feeling like a poet again until fall 2017. So it'd been like three years between, uh, when I finished Trouble the Water until I started feeling like a poet again and feeling, uh, you know, energized and, and excited about the work that I was writing. And, you know, we'll see how it, it, it turns out with this, um, with this space between books in the sense that. I'm still writing things, um, you know, as part of my fellowship. So I'm like writing new poems and, you know, um, and then also the fact that like this year that never ends is still happening. So like, I just feel out of sorts. So I don't quite know like what, <laughs> what will happen in the future, but I think that I'm a poet who, who has to have like necessary downtime. And then like a thing that I want, that I hope I can give myself space to do with the third book whenever that happens is not feeling the pressure to to rush and be published and to let myself just have time to like focus on the poem and like push myself to to not rest on my laurels and to not be comfortable so like i hope that i can give myself that that time and that grace to just like you know work on a poem and not rush and not just send it off to a journal because i think it's like awesome the next week <laughs> right yeah yeah that's that comes with with time and with growth um so uh maybe i have time for this is this is kind of like a more of a uh a light, not, i guess not like a harder question but um in leaving um lastly i always ask this of our guests um what's one piece of advice you would want to tell to maybe a poet in the audience um, who is maybe writing right now or thinking about starting something or maybe has written something but put it away and, and hasn't come back to it. What's the one thing you can offer in terms of advice? Um, oh goodness, my, my advice is, is this, is that as long as, as long as you're, as you're loving writing and as long as you are deeply invested in language and using language to to write poems. Like if you have that deep investment and passion in writing and also probably more importantly in reading uh, poetry of all kinds, you know, the classics, contemporary stuff, things in translation, um, as long as you have that passion, you are a poet. You know, I think that people think that, you know, you have to have your book published, that you have to like be, have your poems published in all the highfalutin magazines, that you even need an MFA um, to call yourself a poet. But I think that as long as you have that passion, then like you can call yourself a poet and that like you, only you can define and decide like what you want your art to do and how you want it to look and how you want it to move through the world. And that's the most important thing is like knowing yourself as a poet and knowing what kind of work you want it to do and, you know, constantly pushing yourself to be a better artist. So yeah, publication isn't the end all or be all. It's the, it's the writing and loving books. That is like, I could not have thought of a better answer. Thank you so much. So I wanted to remind, uh, well, first of all, Thank you, Derek, so much for Aww. this wonderful, wonderful <laughs> discussion. And thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, Thanks for having means, me. It means the world to me. Um, and if you have not checked out the comments, please take a look uh, and uh, uh, get yourself a copy of Derek Austin's Trouble the Water. They're in the link provided at boeditions.org, um, um, preferably anywhere but Amazon. Um, and look out for his new um, 
collection tenderness this fall. Um, so again, thank you, Derek, for um, spending time with us here um, at the U.S. Center Arts Regional Arts um, Center. And um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you uh, all for uh, sticking around and tuning in. Thank you. <laughs>